Hi, this is Peter Holzapple from the DBs, and you are here with me on Icon Fetch. Welcome to Icon Fetch, the web's premier music interview show. Now, here's your host, Tony Peters. For an album that was deemed unreleasable at the time of recording and has never had a proper running order, Big Star's Third has certainly gotten its due. It's now considered one of the greatest albums of all time. After the sudden passing of Big Star frontman Alex Chilton in 2010, an all-star group of musicians got together to pay tribute, including Mike Mills of R.E.M., Mitch Easter of Let's Active, Chris Stamey of the DBs, and members of the Posies. They found that the magic they created was worth continuing. Now, after playing live shows all over the world, they decided to document things with Thank You Friends, Big Star's Third Live, and more, a DVD-CD combo just released by Concord Bicycle Music. Thank you. And to talk about it, we welcome in the musical director of the project, Chris Stamey. Chris, how are you, man? Hi, good to be here. Good, yeah. Um, now, the origins of this go back, uh, I mean, your connections to Big Star go back way, way back. Um, what's interesting in the new documentary, Mitch Easter talks about how he actually heard Big Star on the radio. Now, I don't think that was <laughs> that was pretty lucky for him to do that. How did you first uh, hear Big Star music? Um, same way. Uh, I think we both, uh, the same week, but in different cars, heard uh, Babies Beside Me, which was uh, a single, I don't know if it was top 20, maybe in, in our hometown of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Nice, nice, nice. So so you heard that, and I mean, you, you're hearing it top 10, top 20 in Winston-Salem. You just sort of assume that everybody knows about Big Star, right? And you start, I imagine you start talking to other people, and... You know, the records were not easy to find and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, as but as time went on, you know, the legend kind of grew with that. Um, and, and then I understand uh, in 78, you helped and released the, the Chris Bell single, I Am The Cosmos. How did you get involved in that? Well, I'd, I'd been playing with Alice Children for uh, about a year at that point. Uh, he was living in New York, and we had a band. And he had, um, I think he would reached kind of the limit of what he could do in New York at that time, and he went back to Memphis for a bit. And he came back up to visit, and he said, well, you know, Chris Bell has this song. Uh, he's been slaving over all these different mixes, and he, Alex said that I should put out on my tiny record label and Alex didn't have a recording of it so what he did to pitch the song to me was he took a guitar and he sang it to me wow. and uh, himself and I thought well that sounds great you know and of, of course I hadn't heard the record um, but you know it, it, it was uh, shocking and amazing to think I could put out anything Chris Bell had done and I called him up and I said, well, I'd love to hear this. And so Chris went over that afternoon, I believe, to Ardent Studios and uh, held, literally held a telephone receiver up <laughs> to the speakers and nice. played it. Wow. And I said, that's great. You know, there was, of course, no way to email a file or anything like that and, right. uh, or even make a, a CD copy. The only way to make copies was cassettes, which he did. And... Um, and we talked about the what should be on the B-side, and uh, he had a song called Fight at the Table that he thought was an exciting rocking track, but I really liked the song You and Your Sister, that, um, and, and I kind of pushed him that that would be a good flip, uh, in that uh, I'm the Cosmos is very rocking and anthemic, and You and Your Sister is very personal, and, uh, you know, it was a great... I, I so I love the flip of I Am The Cosmos as well, which is also in the movie as a, or it's as a bonus track on the CD. The sister says that I'm no good Reassure her if I could um, It's the last time that 
Alex and uh, Bell, Chris Bell sang together. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I mean, you know, what a in the in the documentary that they put out about Big Star a few years ago. I mean, you you, you get the impression that you know, I mean, big, you know, Chris had kind of labored for a long time to. You know, and you went over to England and tried to get a recording deal over there and that kind of thing. Um, you know, it was just kind of tragic the the way all that ended. Certainly. Well, he died in a car accident shortly after the forty five came out. Um, but you know, I, I, yes, it was it was tragic. Yeah. Um, I, I think he did. I am told. I was told many times by John Fry actually that. He found a lot of satisfaction in two things in that last year. He loved that the 45 came out, um, and that meant a lot to him, and that so that meant a lot to me. And also, he loved that the Big Star Records were reissued on EMI in in Europe because they had that EMI sticker on them, logo on them, which was the same thing that was on the Beatle records. And uh, so Chris actually was feeling more upbeat about everything there before the accident. Right, right. Now, around the same time, uh, Big Star Third finally comes out. I mean, it had been recorded in 74 and was shelved. Um, when did you first hear Third? Um, my friend Will Rigby and I bought, uh, and maybe Peter Holzapel as well, several of us ordered um, a bootleg cassette of it from the back of a collector magazine. Um and I guess somebody had run them off from the very few lacquers that were made of the record when they were shopping it. So we got these cassettes, and it was, um, it sounded kind of strange, <laughs> you know, particularly uh, compared to the instrumental precision of the earlier records, which were done in an entirely different way. So I, I guess that was probably 75, I mean, shortly after it was uh, finished. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a stark contrast to the the kind of, you know, really melodic pop of the of the first two records. Um, I mean, did you find I think a lot a lot of people say that the more you listen to it, that you just seem to hear more every time you hear it. Um, I, I think there's a, a the myth and the reality. I actually think that um, although there are um, amorphous elements and or, or difficult elements in the record. It's not nearly as weird as it seemed, as the story has it. If you actually listen to things like Blue Moon, um, Take Care, uh, you know, Alex is singing great. The arrangements are amazing. Um, it was just a different approach. Um, I, I, my understanding from talking to Lisa Hone, is, uh, uh, or Lisa Allridge at the time, is that she and Alex would sit around and listen to a lot of the Velvet Underground records. Um, and if you think about the different colors on the Velvet Underground records, you, you can see how maybe that carried over. You know, those records have drones and feedback and um, kind of like first take performances. So I think that was part of it. Right, right. Um, but, if... you know, the, the other thing that you have to look at in comparing it to the first two Big Star records is that particularly in the 60s and, and still in the 70s, um, there was a feeling of taking it further. Okay, you've done that as a band. The next time you go in the record at studio, a recording studio, you're not going to tread water. You're going to see where can you go from where you've landed before. Um, at, later on in rock music, when people started to actually make large amounts of money, there was more incentive to just repeat what you'd done. But uh, there certainly wasn't large amounts of money being made. And I think that the process with the Big Star Third record was similar to the, you know, the Beatles doing the Magical Mystery Tour songs or the White Album. You know, you, you, you've done it this way a few times. Let's go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. To go in a different direction kind of thing. So, I mean, if, if we flash forward to, you know, the, uh, the 2000s and, and maybe even 2010, I mean, the, the Big Star Live oh. project was something that you – had had in in on your mind even before Alex Chilton passed away. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit in the liner notes about it, but essentially what happened, um, I kind of blame Elliot Smith, who was a 
um, of course, a big fan of the Big Star music as well and covered several of them. Um, but we, we didn't, uh, after Elliot Smith died, uh, we put together a concert at the Cat's Cradle here in North Carolina of a lot of his music. And these tribute shows, I mean, everybody's been to them and, you know, there'll be sparks that fly among a lot of things that don't quite connect. And, you know, it, it, but this Elliot Smith concert was done really deeply and excellently. And, um, we were very happy with it. I was not musical director for it. I'd found a friend of mine. I couldn't take it on at the time, uh, Tyson Rogers, to direct it. But it, it, anyway, we felt, well, this is kind of cool. We, us North Carolina folks, did great here. What can we do? And I was sitting around with F- Frank Heath from Cat's Cradle and said, aha, well, if we're going to take it further, which is this idea of going beyond again, if we're going to take it further, let's try the Big Star Third record. Because uh, that seemed hard, and uh, really, we had that conversation, <laughs> and then nothing happened. <laughs> um, and but uh, like a year later, Frank called me back and said, "You know, we should try this." And and I called John Fry at Ard- Ardent and Carl Marsh, who'd done the original arrangements, and everybody got excited about it, and um, it became like a little community effort to figure out that we actually could do it meaning that we could get the multi-track tapes and we could get the original scores rewritten by Carl and uh, try to do this recreation live, kind of like you see a favorite movie and then you make a Broadway play of it, perhaps. Um, we were, you know, we got all in gear to do that and I called Jody and, I, and he said, well, I'll play. And then I said, well, I, I want to run this by Alex. And he said, well, come down to South by Southwest, which was the next week, and talk to Alex. And um, we both knew that it was very unlikely that Alex would want to sing it, but he was an, un- was an unpredictable guy. Um, and I wanted, I kind of wanted to have his blessing for it. So uh, I was about to leave for South by Southwest, and we all heard that he had died of a heart attack. So I never actually talked to him um, I will also say that I know from things he said, you know, later on that he got grew tired of these songs and he thought that the lyrics were kind of like a transition for him. He liked the more, um, you know, funkier R&B, uh, clever, very tightly written lyrics rather than the kind of vague things that sometimes on the record. But when I played with him in New York, the songs on third were very dear to him, and, and they're the songs we would play. I mean, we would play Holocaust, and we would play Nighttime, and, you know, Kangaroo, live in clubs. I mean, we would, you know, after midnight at CBGB's, we'd be playing Kangaroo. Nice. And, uh, so I, I, I felt like that was an implicit um, approval right. of the process. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you you said you were actually going back to the multi tracks to be able to kind of decipher. Uh, I mean, I that's that's pretty amazing to be able to actually kind of have that sort of attention to detail to go back and really try to. I mean, did you get a new appreciation for these recordings when you're actually hearing, um, you know, the individual instrumentation kind of thing? Well, certainly a d- deeper understanding. And, you know, this is not when I'm getting the multi tracks, it's not. They don't sound like they're mixed, you know. It's the individual elements as recorded. So yeah, I got a, uh, even more appreciation for John Fry's work. John had produced or mixed and helped produce the Big Star, all the Big Star records. Right. Although Jim Dickinson produced the third one. Right. Just right. Mixed. Yeah. In any, any any case, yeah, it was amazing, and uh, you got to see. I got to hear how careful much of it was. You know, I would get a track that had a, you know, I get a few tracks where you'd see the evolution of an idea, like the operatic singing on Holocaust. You know, they went from Alex and his friends trying to do it to then a little more organized version of that, and then the actual um, train singers that did it, you know. Um, So, you know, it was amazing that John Fry did that and trusted me and Mitch Easter and the rest of us to not... Put it all up on the internet. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and you kind of had a coup as well of, of getting Carl Marsh involved. I mean, this is the guy oh, that did, you know, did the original strings on, on third. And then from what I understand, he wrote some new arrangements. Is that right? Well, what happened was uh, the original paper was lost. So we got the uh, individual isolated tracks of the strings and bassoon that had written and he could remember it well enough. And he, he re notated it. He wrote it out again, exactly what was on the record because we didn't have the paper anymore. Um, then I went and I wrote additional orchestrations for a, a bunch of these songs. Like I said, we used to play Holocaust. There, there were no strings or uh, there was no orchestral element to that on the recording, but I could remember how, what Alex would do on guitar. And... You rise around most and can't get out of bed and you can Sleep. Same with Kangaroo. I first saw you. You had on blue jeans. You know, I. So I wrote a number of the orchestrations that are the full things. Okay. Uh, All right. Then for this concert, um, we were going to go to Carnegie Hall. Carl and I were rehearsing at Carnegie Hall with Cronus Quartet, who. I hope your listeners are aware of them. Um, they're a very brave and groundbreaking uh, 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 string quartet that specializes in the modern repertoire and, and, very, and encourages it. Um, so we were going to go rehearse with them, and I said, Carl, you know, why don't you expand on what you did uh, 40 years ago and write some, a few new intros? And we talked about making one a little bit like Black Angels by George Crumb and, uh, and, you know, exaggerating the harmonics in nighttime. And so, yeah, there were a few things that had these links that Carl wrote uh, for the film that are just amazing, you know. And and so you, you said you were rehearsing at Carnegie Hall. How did it move to the uh, rather appropriate Alex Theater? Um... Yeah, it, it's funny. Well, uh, we we did that rehearsal with Kronos, but, you know, we've done these arrangements. And, and by arrangements, I mean they're mostly written on paper. You, re- I mean, not all the guitar stuff, but a lot of, there, there's a notated, ver- you know, element to all this. So we've done this in the Barbican in London and Australia, uh, the Sydney Festival, and all over America doing just a couple of shows a year. Um just when it made sense to be able to do it. Um, and we couldn't find, we looked in LA and there weren't many options that were remotely affordable. Um, it, it's very really tricky, particularly shooting a movie, you know, the costs um, get really complicated. And, and we found the Alex Theater, which is a great venue. And I actually really kicked and screamed about it. I didn't want to have, you know, do it, put Alex's name huge and right. he's not there. It, right. But, in the end, you know, it was the best venue. Right. And it's cool in its own way. It is strange. We didn't, but we did not pick it because it was called the Alex. Right. We picked it because it was the best place to do it. So now you've um, got this all star lineup of people. Um, I mean, some of the people have been around for the touring that you've done in the States and overseas, right? I mean, it, you're talking about, you know, Mike Mills and Mitch Easter and, and the guys from the Posies. I mean, they've they've co- most of these people have been at all the shows, right? Yeah, we we think it's a like a, a band without a name, I guess. Right. Yeah, but but then you know, you, obviously, you you pull in people like Jeff Tweedy, you pull in Dan Wilson, you know, um, Ray did, Davies, uh, not in this movie, but has done it done it with us. Uh, Richard Lloyd. Um, there's actually a whole list in there of. Oh yeah, that's the, impressive. Yeah, Mar- people. Marshall Crenshaw and Jason Faulkner and Dave Faulkner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The Connells. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's amazing how many people have been involved with this. That's an impressive list of people. I think. What we've done most all the time is they've come up and sung, and we've still been the band, and it's been a, or maybe they play guitar with us, you know. Right. Um, right. But it, it's generally not. Oh, will you come and do this tribute? It's generally will will you be a lead singer with our uh, presentation of right. this music? So when you're putting together this movie, how do you decide? You got all these people. How do you decide who sings what? Um, it, 
like casting a movie, I guess. Um, you know, we know what the ranges of the songs. I mean, if um, somebody can't sing an F sharp confidently, I'm going to give them a different song. Okay. Um, you know, it's who who can bring an emotional center to it. You know, um, Ira Kaplan has sung a lot of different songs in this. Uh, in the different concerts, and I think that might have been the first time he did take care. Take care not to hurt yourself. Beware of the need for help. And, I, you know, I just thought he could do it. You know, I thought he would be great. Right. So it's done carefully. And I mean, um, September Girls with Mike Mills singing lead. September I mean, that's so cool, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that one, we've, we've moved around a little bit on that, but Mike, um, <laughs> Mike is really great, and uh, that's one of his very favorite songs. It, generally, once Mike started singing a particular song, uh, it ended up being his on all the shows. You know, he... he uh, I know he wasn't the lead singer in R.E.M., but he's really got something going on. Right, yeah. It definitely shows off a side of him you don't normally see. He was just the kind of the background vocal guy normally. So, Right. But, yeah, I mean, and for 13, you kind of have a different perspective on things with the girl singing there. Won't you let me walk you home from school? Won't you let me meet you? Yeah, I mean, um... Just tried that with Skyler and never looked back. Nice, um, yeah. You know, it's a, uh, we did change the move the key up for her for her vocal range a little bit uh, from uh, B flat to D, um, but um, yeah, I mean she's amazing. She um, was a little bit green for performing. She actually came in as kind of as like a background singer and. Loud a flute player, and uh, I, I said, "Well, you want to try this one?" And then <laughs> it, it floored us. You know, uh, it, um, it's continually been one of the favorite things of the concert. The way that she and Brett Harris and Django Haskins come together on that one. Nice, yeah, and and kind of a no-brainer that you sing "I Am the Cosmos." <laughs> kind of fitting, right? Kind of come in full circle sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't sing it very often, um, I, but I was glad to do it for this. Nice, nice. Okay. So, I mean, the the DVD's out. I, I, I wanted to bring up one more thing. There's there's It's really cool to have the interspersed interviews with some of the artists in between the songs, and I'm amazed at how many times record stores are mentioned as kind of an influence on the people finding Big Star. I think that's kind of cool. Or, you know, it's not even record stores, but it's the proprietors who seem to have a, uh, who want to help educate or curate the uh, their clientele. And, right. Um, it's not only with the someone telling Pat that he should listen to the Big Star record, um, but th- this is happening online in a different way, but... Um, it's definitely a loss for me. Yeah. Same with the great, you know, independent bookstores. You know, you, you, you have a relationship within your community with someone who kind of gets to know what you like, and it's a lot different than Amazon suggesting I might like something because I've snooped around. Um, it's very different. I, I think yeah. that, that curation from the independent record stores um, we, I hope we can hold on to that. Yeah, me too. I mean, growing up in uh, Raleigh, Durham area, you had school kids, and I can't tell you how many times I went into a record store like that and had the guy behind the counter going, "Hey, I think you'd like this," you know. And he was exactly. right. Exactly. And Steve Judge runs School Kids still, and he's in there fighting. And right. you know, it's a great, great store. So right, right. Um, so, so are you guys, um, are, are there any more? Uh, are you still doing a couple of shows, Big Star Live, um, every year kind of thing? You got more things on the horizon um well I, i've pretty much been saying never again after <laughs> even the first one. right okay <laughs> to be honest because they're complicated and 
I, I think we might do one or two more. I'm not sure I'll be involved. Um, right. The band without a name, everybody enjoys each other's company, and we all like the idea of rising to a challenge, um, trying to trying to get the music in a situation where people can be genuinely moved by it. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's a privilege. So never say never, though. That's what you got to learn, right? It's a t- Oh, I say never all the time. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be prepared to you know go back on it, right? So, um, so you, I mean, you've got a website, chrisdamey dot com, and I thought what was really cool is checking that out. That you've got production tips for bands. Uh, how how cool is that? I was a columnist for Tape Op magazine for a while, so some of that derives from those Tape Op, um, you know, Ask Eloise kind of. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's directly taken from those, but it's derived from that. Okay, and I mean, so you're you're still doing producing, mixing kind of thing. Uh, I am. I I I'm, I do pro- producing and mixing. I mixed a, a Marshall Crenshaw live record that's nice. really cool wow. uh, last week. Um, it was recorded with his first band right after that first album came out on Warner Brothers, and recorded multi track at a great concert in San Francisco. Wow, uh, nice. I just turned that in. Um, I'm working with a band called Paranoid Style, uh, a very interesting um, lyricist. And, uh, you know, that's uh, been a cool thing. Um, Skylar Gadaz, who, who you're talking about, Song 13, um, you know, she's uh, it should not be seen as just a singer of big star songs. That's uh, not what she's about. She, I, we did a great record together um, called Oleander. Um, I, I love that record, and uh, so um, yeah, I keep busy. Keep busy. I mean, mainly, I'm writing music. That's what I do every day. Right. Nice, nice. All right. Well, it's Chris. It's been good talking to you. The new CD is "Thank You, Friends," "Big Star," "Third Live," and more. And uh, we wish you luck on it. All right. It, it's been great to talk to you. You've been listening to Icon Fetch with Tony Peters. Want more great interviews? Head on over to IconFetch.com. There you'll find every interview we've ever done, plus CD reviews, This Day in Music, and a random album of the day. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. Who's Tony going to interview next? It could be you. Send us what you've got to Tony Peters, Icon Fetch, P.O. Box 292134, Dayton, Ohio. Zip code 45429 or email Tony host at iconfetch.com until next time this is Joe Kelly have a great day